that priority? Okay, we can't check it. <coughs> Any questions? Hi. and the government changed. And I think that was very much a part of it. So it's true that the protest has come at some personal cost, but I don't think that uh, they should necessarily be ruled out. And it's possible that I'm not advocating um, anyone to do this in Singapore. Um, different circumstances are, of course, different for different things, and I wouldn't do it in a country that isn't my own, I guess. You have your own um, places where you think you should fight, but I think um, protests are not necessarily a dead end, was one comment. The second was on the sort of slightly depressing um, tone of, uh, uh, I guess, sorry, I can't pronounce your name properly, the last speaker, um, who, who, who said, you know, that things are getting much worse. And it, I think things are far from perfect. But again, in my lifetime in Australia, black people went from being non-citizens to citizens. Um, women got the vote in the last hundred years. I think that now we're fighting about freedom to access um, intellectual property is a happy thing. It's better than fighting for um, the right for women to vote, for example. We've actually made some progress. And the final thing was one of the ways we can change. So I'm an academic. I write papers. And in our subfield of computational linguistics, we opened up all our journals. So we basically took control from the publishers and we said, we, we will release it. And partly it's because no one reads our journals anyway. So it's, it's not as if they were losing a lot of money or anything. I read one of your EBMT papers recently, but uh, I can't remember what it's about. OK. And it was there for you to read, legally <laughs> there for you to read, because we made this fight. We said, it makes sense to release things, and we will release things. So without changing the legislation, you can also make, I think, useful changes. Although changing legislation would also be a fantastic thing. So I'd like to respond uh, briefly. Uh, I agree that the, uh, the relationship, that, that things have gotten better in some ways, um, but, and I, I don't know the situation in Singapore, although, um, and excuse me for pronouncing the name incorrectly, I did see the case of Roy Nguyen Ki Ling uh, recently that indicates that maybe there are still some complexities going on. Um, that said, you know, if I look at America and I look at Europe, which I know much better, you know, in the US we've gone from a political system that was merely corrupt in a lot of ways 150 years ago to a political system now where it is no longer, uh, we have no more illegal bribery politicians in America. It's wonderful. Uh, we've legalized all of the bribery. Uh, it's a big problem. Uh, and there are structural issues which run incredibly deep of state capture here. Um, the, the previous speaker to me mentioned looking at the women's suffrage movements as an example for, for, for how that fight happened. You know what the women's suffrage movement did? They got out in the streets and they fought. And I don't mean they fought as in they marched with placards. They did that too. I mean they broke windows. They got arrested. They got murdered by the police in numbers. And that was what it took. It took an actual fight. It took inconveniencing those in power to a degree that not changing became impossible. That is what it takes. Now, I don't necessarily think that street protest is the best option. I do not, certainly do not know enough about the Singaporean context to make any comment on uh, 
on what makes sense there. But I also don't think that this notion that we can simply, for example, petition the rich to share their money with other people, and that if we send them a really nice letter, if we send them a nice enough letter, they'll just kind of hand over their money to the poor. No, this is not how history works. Um, I believe that as we are in a time of systemic change, and as we are dealing with many systems that have different ways of leverage, there are places where we can provoke that leverage, but we will need to do that. Cool. Um, okay, same thing. Most of the way I was trying to uh, communicate there was I was trying to be like a, a gadfly and like bite you all. Um, because um, I don't understand how these mechanisms work. Um, and as successful as like fighting might be, right, and as successful as protesting might be, I don't really get something, I don't really feel comfortable about something unless I get the system. I get the system involved and I can predict it to an extent at which if I make some fixed change, I can have an outcome which I can anticipate in advance. And, um, okay, so thing, right? So um, when you say, okay, so uh, you fight a person, right? And, and, and you inconvenience them to an extent that they have to make a decision. I don't really understand how that works at a mechanical level. And it seems in particular incompatible with full knowledge of the military capacity of you know, the state and government. And maybe someone can explain that to me because I'm really confused. You get it to me? <laughs> but if we look at what, um, yeah, for example, Aaron's was doing. Oh, okay. So let's see what he did very successfully <coughs> and what he did very successfully um, was spearhead the killing of Sopa. And it's not easy to kill a bill that's going to be passed into law. There is so much momentum, there's so much money going to it, that so much political will to get something passed into law, it's really hard to kill. But he did it, and if we watch the movie and we take what is there as on face value, he didn't do it by street protest per se. He was doing it through a very scientific method of getting the voters to speak to their representatives and also the big money corporations to show their dissatisfaction to the political representatives. At this point it gets boring because it's politics, but there was a systemic way in which he did it. And so understanding the lawmaking process, at least I can talk about that, although I don't know politics. If anybody here is a political science person, please raise your hand, save us. Um, he basically was able to hack the political system and able to manipulate how the result came out. It would have been wonderful if he had been alive to be able to do that for so many other laws that could have been changed in a very similar way. I mean, from that, I think the great thing is that it was done in the open and all of us saw how it was done and now we have to find a way how we can do that in Singapore because we know that if we go outside the presidential palace Istana and we carry placards basically we get arrested <laughs> right that has already been shown so that and then after we get arrested nobody really does much so but what he did seem to be very effective so if there's something that we can learn from that and I'm not a person who can advise on that so I can't help you but if there's anyone who understands politics and technology as well, we need more people like that to help. One of the things I'd say is that there is no um, there is no way of predicting outcomes. We have to go into this knowing that we have no idea exactly what the outcomes of our actions will be, and that's fine. We have to learn to live with structural uncertainty. Um, and actually, one of the reasons that I, I think that this is good, um, that there is uncertainty, that it's good, that we don't necessarily know exactly how things are going to come out, is that we, it turns out, are much better at living with uncertainty. Individual humans and networks of humans 
are much better at living with uncertainty than institutions and markets are, than the structures that we see oppressing us in the world. And that is an advantage that we can, can very much use to our benefit. Okay, there's a question over there. Cedric has a thing. Cedric, turn on the mic. It's on. It's on, right? Oh, is it? You're going to have to project your voice to me because the mic didn't come to us. Oh, okay, all right. Hi. I suspect that most of us here are technologists, am I right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and the, the, we've, we've spent, spent most of the night talking about, about uh, the technicalities of Eric's case, uh, what happened, and uh, what his life story was. Um, so Eric, for me, was a, a huge inspiration. Uh, I think for Vikram as well. Both of us shared very similar views on him, and we followed him, uh, much like you know, fans of a rock band or, or, or followers of Jesus, not really. Um, but, uh, what I what I want to remind everyone of, at least, uh, I mean, we, we have lots of legal discussions, but Aaron was a beacon for a lot of people because he showed that uh, people. Oh, sorry. Right. Right. Um, I, Aaron was a beacon of hope for many people uh, because he showed that with the right amount of leverage and with the will to believe that you can change things you can actually change things. Now I know that as technologists, we often like live in our little startup bubbles of privilege where we can work everywhere in the world. And we think that, you know, and, 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 you know we think that you just build the solutions to the problems and someone somewhere will apply those solutions to, to solve more problems. Um, but Aaron was very inspirational for me because he showed that it's not enough to just build solutions. You have to go on and actually look for ways to apply them to the world. Uh, I think I would like um, if, if you remember uh, that a lot of his life story was just the will to believe that you can change things and that you have a responsibility to change things instead of just being a technologist and like living in your little privilege bubble, uh, thinking that you would change the world by sitting down and writing code. Because some problems in the world are not uh, like, I mean, you can't solve them with code or through the cloud. Um, anyway, that's all I have to say. Okay, so um, as an externally um, declared Aaron's work fanboy, um, I should mention um, one of the thoughts that he had about affecting change without quitting your job. Um, in the year or so uh, before we lost him, um, Aaron Swartz, Swartz was uh, active on a community web blog um, called Less Wrong. And, uh, one of the things he wrote about, and one of the things he really cared about there, was optimal philanthropy. And the goal there is saying, okay, so I have like a shit ton of cash, right? Or maybe I did, but then I was in a lawsuit, and whatever, right? Uh, and I want to give this away in a way that does the most good. And there's this organization which says, okay, so I'm gonna investigate these thousands of charities, and I'm gonna take maybe two, you know, that do, do the most good, that most effectively, in a utilitarian sense, do well in human lives, and I'm going to count these out. And in the case in which you know you're comfortable traveling all over the world, and you like working in technology directly rather than leveraging that in other areas, and you're happy people using your stuff, there is an opportunity for you to affect positive change without really changing your lifestyle. I think that's kind of cool. Any other comments, questions? No? Comment on what you can do 
Could you repeat what you When, uh, if we look at something like Skype, Skype has had an amazing impact on the world. Um, Skype has meant that we now see international remittances, people sending money back to their families at home, are, are gone from being well under half of what international foreign aid was to now being something like eight times. And you can trace that directly along the line with communications get across nations getting cheap. And so this is a really interesting example of where having a, uh, having a structural shift that's purely technology driven has completely, has, has had massive political ramifications. So I don't think it's true, like, you know, work in a startup, write code, do that, absolutely do that. I'm not saying that you have to, you know, go be a, a protester in the street because that is not necessarily the best way to change systems that, that affect us. But understand the world that you want to live in, have a dream of what that world looks like, and then figure out how to go build that world. Don't just build the things that are easy, you know, and that are going to make you money, that are going to let you IPO, let you do whatever. Build things that actually actively build the world you want to see, whatever they are. Please come up, talk to them while the rest of us are.